How confident do you get the sense that those around the Ohio State program are that they will be in the field of four? Watching that announcement was unlike anything I've done. I think all three of these teams, they make very good arguments and you're kind of nitpicking. On December 7th, 2014, college football history occurred when the initial FBS playoff committee convened to select the participants in the sport's first ever four-team playoff. We were up all night and we catered Bob Evans in at about eight and we stayed up until noon the next day. We're calling the commissioner. I'm calling media people I know. Gene Smith walks in my house. He looks at me, he goes, we're in. I go, really? And he goes, no, and he started laughing. I had the remote because there's times I wanted to have conversation and other times I wanted everybody to shut up. We are ready now to unveil the four teams who will compete for the national championship. We're all just like this, looking at the TV. If it urban wouldn't look. Who will play Alabama? And it will be the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Everybody screamed. I looked up and I saw her name. I couldn't believe I was seeing it. I was just screaming in the house and crying. That's probably the most unbelievable season that anyone has ever been through. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what we actually did. We got as hot as a team can get right at the right time. that it's not about just talent. It's about how these guys came together, how they truly, truly selflessly sacrificed for one another. I can't remember coaching a team that's been through more. If you can hit the storm and come out the other end stronger, that's called a real, real team. I've coached a long time, but the job that Coach Meyer did, I don't think anyone could have done a better job in the country. Got a job to do, boy. We got a job to do. We've been given a mission. I've always followed the Buckeyes. I've been a Buckeye ever since I could say the word Buckeye. Being from Asheville, I mean, Ohio State was our home college team to root for, so we were all Ohio State fans. Urban wore number 45 on his high school football for in honor of Archie Griffin. Urban Meyer grew up in a household where his dad was pretty demanding of him uh, about striving for excellence and he grew up in a community you know like a lot of communities around ohio you know you play football you play baseball competition's what it's all about you know every season we'd be playing baseball basketball football so it was always competition on everything i'd be practicing uh, basketball and, I, and the weight room door would be open at the school and Irvin would be in there non-stop two hours straight it's a great opportunity to come back to my home state where I was born, where I grew up, and our goal is to compete and win Big Ten championships. The excitement surrounding Urban Meyer's homecoming as the new Buckeyes head coach in November of 2011 was suddenly tempered three weeks later when the school received NCAA sanctions for a player barter scheme. The turmoil surrounding the circumstances had contributed to a 6-6 six and six regular season earlier that fall under headman Luke Fickle. Michigan finally beats Ohio State. For the first time in a long time at Ohio State, there was some real turmoil and, you know, where was the future and where was the direction of the program? He's in, and the Boilermakers upset Ohio State. We first came in, we were thrown to the fire. We had to basically take over and try to win games because of the fact that people couldn't play. There was a lot of very good coaches on the staff, very good players in the program, but the ship was running without a rudder. A bunch of long, good athletes flying around four to six A to B. You know why? Because that's our culture. Non-negotiable culture. I think it's a gift that I've always been a pretty good motivator. I think maybe that's the way I was raised. I'm so intrigued by the competitive spirit of people that that is so much more valuable than just pure talent. We faced him in 06. We saw what kind of an animal and a beast he can be. We were up against some people who had drank a gallon of fire water, and I, <laughs> we didn't get our dose yet. We just got whooped. That's a testament to an Urban Meyer coach staff. Everything's about improvement every day. And it sounds cliched or trifle, but it's not. Miller dances, touchdown, what a play! In 2012, Meyer's first Buckeye team 
burdened by sanctions and a postseason ban, defied the pundits and completed the season a perfect 12-0. 2012, as flawed as that team was, fact is they would have played Notre Dame in that championship game. I was asked by ESPN to go down and watch the national championship game. I am on the field watching Alabama warm up. And I thought, this doesn't look like our team at all. We are still a ways away from being where we needed to be. And the chase was on. We were chasing what I just saw. After that, he sent a text and said, the chase is on, the chase is real. It was like a challenge. It was a challenge of our program should be at a level that it isn't. Urban, how close are you to getting the roster you truly want at Ohio State? The signing date was big. You know, we uh, we closed really strong. Coach Meyer recruiting. My first time having a conversation with him in his office, he says, he said, what are you going to do when, when I hand you the crystal ball? I said, okay, we're going to practice this because this will happen someday. I grab the crystal ball. I hold it above my head. I hand it to you. You kiss it, raise it above your head, and then hand it to your teammates. And so we went through the routine. While Meyer was landing future stars, the 2013 team was led by a third-year starter, quarterback and Heisman Trophy candidate Braxton Miller. Into the end zone, touchdown! When you call a play and you think this progression, this is where you read, but well, Braxton, it doesn't really work like that. It feels like a play never ends with Braxton. But people forget how good Braxton Miller is. Miller, going to air it out long. He's got a man out there. To take Braxton Miller out of that offense, that's a 500 football team. The Buckeyes finished the 2013 season 12 and 2, and Miller was named the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year for the second consecutive season. That January, the Buckeyes lost to Clemson in the Orange Bowl, where Miller suffered a shoulder injury and underwent off-season surgery in preparation for 2014. I saw Braxton was taking it slow, and I figured he was just. You know, getting ready for Saturdays. It caught me off guard with his shoulder. I was actually on the field with our new president when he got injured. We heard the noise. It was like a, a scream. So we looked over and, and saw him on the ground. Um, I was like, you know, my jaw dropped and my heart dropped. I remember Coach Meyer had his hands on his knee and, and he looked up and He's like, what does that mean? I'm like, what do you mean, what does that mean? His shoulder's out, he's done, it's over. The Ohio State University has a problem at the quarterback position. Braxton Miller will miss the entirety of the 2014 campaign. In the morning, I said, how'd you sleep? He said, not good. I just, I'm just like trying to figure things out. What can we expect from Ohio State if they have to be without Braxton Miller? I think it takes them out of the national title run. The main thing you remember thinking is, number one, doing your story, but then number two, uh, is J.T. Barrett ready? No, 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 Bobby, Bobby. Oh, yes. He was the first hand-picked quarterback by Urban Meyer and Tom Herman. J.T. Barrett was injured in early October of his senior year at high school at Ryder High in Wichita Falls, Texas. He didn't play the rest of that year. He spent his freshman year at Ohio State redshirting. We had seen video of him in his junior year to take a quarterback, having never seen them physically throw the football, that's a, that's a little scary. The new starting quarterback would be either redshirt freshman J.T. Barrett or sophomore Cardale Jones. Well, Cardale actually outperformed him in the spring. J.T. maybe not quite as talented, but is a student of the game and just started a bypass Cardale. I actually told my family I want to be the second team quarterback, right? And I was like, yeah. Well, they was like, well, we see you play. And I was like, man, you might see me hold extra points. <laughs> Three days before Braxton hurt his shoulder, JT Barrett had moved ahead of Cardale Jones. Who of you know that was like becoming the vice president? You need quite a bit of seasoning before you go out and try to perform in front of 110,000 people. JT Barrett cut his teeth in his second start in front of the largest crowd in Ohio Stadium history when eighth-ranked Ohio State hosted unranked Virginia Tech in a Week 2 primetime battle. It was a bare front, no deep coverage, so basically they were just outnumbering us in a box. They have more people than we could block. 
So with that, I have like 1.8 seconds to get the ball. Off. In trouble, going down again. And they played a defense that we'd never seen. It was just kind of a, you know, what do we do? And usually, you defeat something like that two or three times, and it kind of goes away. But we didn't defeat it enough for them to stop calling it. You have such young players going out there. To the end zone. Oh, and it should have been caught. Those guys haven't had to adjust and haven't had that kind of adversity, you know, in a primetime game. Throws, and it's intercepted again, and that's going to be the ball game. All of Ohio State's weaknesses were exposed that night. How much of a surprise yeah. is this performance? Uh, a little bit surprised. I, I thought our skill guys would perform better. I thought we'd protect a little better. It's been a long while since they've known what it's like, but the Buckeyes losing on the field at home. Guys were walking into the locker room before we sang Carmen, Ohio. They're telling us, oh, you know, you got to go sing. For what? Why are we singing? I'm not the best person to be around after a loss. So driving in my car, you know, I'm trying to turn on Luther Vandross to bring me back to reality. Some people are even questioning if we're even going to make a bowl game, if we're even going to have a winning season again. But we have to get by people. Or you're, you're going to see what you saw today, you'll see it every week. So I didn't think just losing eliminated them. But I also thought, having watched that team that night, this is not a championship team. For Ohio State, a win, and most likely they will head to the national championship in Pasadena. The lofty expectations for the 2014 Buckeyes were rooted in consecutive undefeated regular seasons the two previous years. Ohio State entered the 2013 Big Ten Championship game against Michigan State acutely aware of the national implications. And they came down to a one-game season essentially against Michigan State in the Big Ten Championship, and they just didn't play well. Right now, Ohio State faced with a fourth down and a yard and a half. We had pulled out so many unbelievable games, and, and we had done so many unbelievable things for 24 straight games. Here's Braxton Miller, and he won't get it. What a play! It felt to me that that team that we were playing against was a little bit more teamish, I guess, you know, if that's a word. It was an ugly feeling. The 2013 Big Ten football champions, Michigan State Spartans. Everybody's head was down. Um, even the coaches' heads were down. We sat there for about 10, 15 minutes with just utter silence. Coach Meyer finally spoke, and he simply apologized to us. And what makes the loss harder is uh, I really wanted these guys to experience something special, and you know it's going to haunt all of us, I imagine, for a little while, but then uh, that's part of the game. There's just a heaviness, because everybody feels the failure. And that's the sad thing, is because that's the word. It's failure. It was a great team. It was a far better team than the 2012 team, but there just seemed to be something missing. They just didn't quite gel the way the 2012 team had gelled as a team, as kind of brothers. To foster team growth in all facets, Meyer integrated the teachings of leadership consultant Tim Kite into the Buckeyes' day-to-day -day operations. We brought a systematic way to teach coaches and players how to trust each other. The first time I made him do it with our staff, I came unglued because that was going to be the difference. There's a principle in the military called small unit cohesion. The United States soldiers were not motivated to fight for the flag or for the army or for they're motivated to fight for the guy next to them. And we've been through all these incredibly hard times and you just you kind of sit back and look like these guys haven't gone anywhere. I trust my life with that guy. I trust my life with that guy. They put together a leadership council, mostly juniors and seniors. Then JT said, this is his red shirt year, I want to learn more about leadership. And he was the only freshman in the leadership council meetings. 865 crunch. Naturally inside of him, he is a leader. When people saw that he could move the team and play football at this level, then the leadership part started to come out. It's hard to lead the team when you're struggling in the Virginia Tech game. We lost to Virginia Tech. Urban came home after the game. He goes, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine because we're going to get better. 
It was not the urban I usually see after a loss. We all know what's coming down the barrel, and that's a primetime game in a stadium of 110,000 people, and that's going to be a great evaluator. I thought Ohio State would dominate them. I knew that Penn State had a good defense, but it hadn't been tested by an offense like they faced against Ohio State. Elliott trying to get to the edge. Did he get there? Yes, he did. Touchdown. One of our goals going into that game was we wanted to silence the crowd. We wanted to put the crowd out of it early. Got to the left side to Hireman, who slips into the end zone for a touchdown. At 5-1, and one, Ohio State entered the primetime meeting with Penn State as a team inching their way back into the national picture. The Buckeyes built a 17-0 first-half lead, effectively muting the whiteout crowd. After he got sacked in the second quarter, JT Barrett came up holding one of his knees. I got this freshman quarterback that at halftime, our trainer came to me and said he's got a sprained MCL. Most people couldn't play on this. I was in the air. My knee just got tweaked in the air by somebody. One of the problems it was just um, not being able to step and throw like I normally would. Throws across the middle and it's intercepted. And it's going to be touchdown. I thought it was a pretty safe lead. And then when Anthony Zettel intercepted that pass for the pick six, you just knew, okay, now we got a game. Trouble in the backfield again. Barrett's going down again. You're just kind of looking around, and you cannot hear yourself think. The corner of the end zone, and it's caught! If I had to go down there and scream at somebody, I was going to do it because we I knew that we couldn't lose again. I sit with all the coaches' wives, and Michelle Herman left and went and sat in the bus. She couldn't take it anymore. A Penn State field goal in the final seconds sent the game into overtime. You got young guys. Uh, specifically, I remember Raekwon McMillan. We're going into overtime. Coach Fickle looks in the eye and says, you ready? And I mean, like, deer in headlights kind of deal. There's the throw, and it's Hamilton, and he's got it at the two. We go in overtime and face their student body down by seven. And 99% of the time, that script has been written. You lose that game, and I'm actually getting my mindset, what do I say to this team and to make sure we don't lose them? Ohio State knows what they need. Down seven. I think the press box was actually shaking. And I got a redshirt freshman quarterback trotting onto the field after he's thrown a pick six. You come to Ohio State to play an overtime game, have a valley for 110,000 people, prime time. I just looked in everybody's face and I was like, score. Barrett keeps it himself, running around the left side, 20, 15, a 10 yard line, and he's forced out of bounds around the five. Barrett keeps again. it again, and he's in. Touchdown, Ohio State. After JT Barrett tied the score, the redshirt freshman would give the Buckeyes the lead in the second OT. Barrett gets near the goal line. Pile goes into Touch. the end zone. JT Barrett scores. It goes back to the brotherhood of trust. I mean, he was sitting there thinking, like, look, these seniors are depending on me. The offense finally have come through and gave us a chance to win the game, so we just need to close it out. The tackle freezes for a minute. Joey's got just a one-on-one. -on -one. It's him on the back. That's a bad day. Hit and dropped, and the game is over. I just saw all these sophomores that were just selling their bodies out and, you know, giving everything they had to the team as, as sophomores. That just made me realize just how close this team really was. Our quarterback, for him to do what he did at the end of the game, is a testament of who he is and what we are all about. And at the end of the game, who made the plays to win the game? He had to make that play. I am not cutting my guys down. I think that night kind of showed us that, hey, I think these guys, these guys want to win for the guy next to them. They genuinely want to win and succeed for their, their teammates and their brothers. Three days after the gallant Penn State victory, the Buckeyes scattered throughout campus to watch history, the first ever release of the college football playoff poll, which ranked the Scarlet and Gray a disappointing 16th. I think they really did emphasize strength of schedule like they said they were going to. They really buried Ohio State because Ohio State hasn't played a ranked team yet. There was definitely this sense that, okay, who have you beaten? So they knew this was the moment of truth. I don't want to say that game was a revenge game, but I think in a way for some players, how can you not think about that? November 8th, the Big Ten game of the year. 
number 14 Ohio State at number 8 Michigan State. This highly anticipated rematch served as a de facto elimination game for the conference championship and the college football playoff. When you face the best defense, one of the best defenses that we've ever gone against, that was a full year of work into that one game. We left the bus for that game. I pulled my phone out and typed in Michigan State Big Ten Championship win and just watched the highlights, and it infuriated me. We got in the locker room, and I kind of grabbed the receivers. I was like, we're not losing this game. I'm like, you'll have to kill me on this field for us not to... I mean, I'm not leaving this field until we win. Road game again, hostile environment, night game, national TV. I saw a little bit of sloppy play, and I would equate that maybe to nerves. That was the first time that I saw maybe us stress a little bit. Still running into the end zone. Touchdown, Mumfrey. An Ohio State defense that never misses tackles. Missed one here. We didn't necessarily just settle in and relax and play because everybody was so hyped up. Ball comes out again. Another special teams fumble by Ohio State. Trailing 14-7 early in the second quarter, Ohio State faced a third and 23 in its own territory. Coach Meyer kind of pulled me to the side. He said, you know, we, we need to play. We need to, we need to do something on this drive. Smith over the shoulder, catching the 20. And they convert a third of a mile. Keeps it, dives, muscles to the end zone. A fourth down conversion. With three and a half minutes remaining in the first half, Ohio State trailed the Spartans 21-14, and the Buckeye offense seized control. But Michael Thomas' play, in, in my opinion, is what started the avalanche. 15-10-5 touchdown, Michael Thomas, as he catches a strike from JT Barrett and takes it 79 yards to the house. Then Devin Smith, just before halftime, on that big touchdown pass. Guns it long, going Devin Smith toward the end zone. Got it! Six for Devin Smith! It was like... Wow, this just happened. Everything all season long, they've been waiting for this moment to show what they can do. It was fun to be able to show everybody, like, this is Ohio State football. We just looked at each other at the end there, and I was like, wow. And, you know, he knew it, too. We all knew it. The whole team knew it. I mean, look at the emotions from Urban Meyer. He's been waiting a year for this matchup. I was so happy for him. I was just, like, lunged to the middle of the field, and we had this cute little kiss and he just was so happy like the smile was so huge a young team grew up tonight this is a different buckeye team than it was early in the season there was a bravado there was a confidence about them definitely they felt they were something special again boy this has been one very savvy performance by this redshirt freshman jt barrett we were watching espn one day and they did this whole special on jt and how he was a heisman candidate how he was gonna go to new york and i'm like dude they're talking about jt you know that right plenty of room barrett hits the 50 yard line now angles it right side to the 10 barrett to the five and into the end zone jt barrett 11 games into the season the quarterback who entered fall camp as third string was now first rate. JT Barrett had accounted for a whopping 42 touchdowns. JT was growing up, and I think we were growing closer and closer as a family as the season progressed. I just got spooked when the phone call came that said one of your players is missing. I was, I, I was like, oh no, no. The entire Buckeye family was shaken after learning that walk-on defensive lineman and wrestler Costa Kara George went missing during Michigan week. When you hear someone's missing, you don't think it's super serious at that time. And then a few days go by and you still no one's heard anything. So people just kind of start, you know, this is getting kind of weird. Costa Kara George had become a beloved figure among the fellas just because the way he attacked life. They played the Michigan game not knowing what his fate was. They built up that game to make it life and death almost. And then you really have a life and death situation. Number 53, Costa Kara George, a defensive lineman from Columbus, has been missing since Wednesday. The entire university community has Costa and his family in his prayers. 
And then you got senior day. You know, guys are playing their last game in the horseshoe. I mean, it's just so much. There's no question affected them. Fires complete for the touchdown. We came to the sideline, and it was actually our money said it. What the problem looks like to me is y'all, like, are so uptight. And I'm like, he's right. Johnson going to throw it back. Gardner catches it. I said something about it, you know. Yeah, y'all, we... This is this is still a game. Trailing by seven, the Buckeyes mounted a drive deep into Michigan territory with less than a minute remaining in the first half. It was one of those plays where JT did something that really you wouldn't anticipate that he would do. Takes off running. 15, 10, 5, touchdown, JT Barrett. Instead of forcing something, he just made a play. Leaders make plays. We talked about his Heisman candidacy. It just went up. By the end of the third quarter, Barrett had added three more scores to his tally, breaking the Big Ten single-season record for touchdowns. Barrett keeps it. He's in trouble. And he's taken down at the 32. I hear a whistle blown in, like the air just taken out of the stadium. And I turned around and saw JT on the ground. I was like, no way. Guy pulled me from behind and uh, had my leg still underneath me where he kind of went dead weight on it. I actually tried getting up, and uh, I reached my hand out to Jeff. So he's reaching for me to get him up, and I look at his ankle, and his ankle's facing the wrong way. And I'm like, no, man, you need to stay down. They're looking at that right ankle, and Paul, oh. I, don't, I don't think it's going to be uh, good news for Ohio State. When I was on the court, I wasn't like, hey, thanks, man. I was telling him to go away and, like, go win the game. So I start thinking, what can Cardell do, and how do we win this game? Fourth now, and one. What are they going to do? they got to go for it here. Nursing a seven-point lead, Ohio State faced a key decision. Fourth and short, just inside Michigan territory, with under six minutes remaining. Coach Meyer called timeout because he wanted to gather the unit up, and he wanted to look in our eyes. He was like, you know, can we get it? Hell yeah, we can get it. Jones hands it out, and goes all the way to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, touchdown! What about what happened to me is about us. It's about us every single day. When we take that mindset, we're going to go really far. Let's keep on going. He was completely unconcerned about his ankle, completely unconcerned about his future. His whole concern was, guys, don't let this slow you down. It was a significant injury. He wouldn't be back for the following week. It was emotional because it was like a guy passing the torch. Michael Bennett was still inspired by the thought of sort of playing for Costa, but they didn't think it was going to turn out the way it did. We were at a Sunday practice, and I saw some police officers that showed up. And at that point, I, you know, I, I was kind of putting two and two together, like something ain't right here. I prayed. I said, you know, give me some strength. How do you, you know, I'm not meant to deliver this message here. Costa Kara George joined the team this season as a walk-on, and he was found dead Sunday after an apparent suicide. Then he was a dad. There was a dad losing a son. The players lost their brother. It's just like football doesn't matter anymore. Wrestling didn't matter anymore. It's a tragedy, and it was a tragedy for the whole team. Um, a lot of guys were really affected by that. I'm not sure a lot of our players have ever been to a funeral before. A traumatic ordeal like that for anybody is hard. Take this age group that we deal with and it's, it's even harder. And then they get back on the field and like, okay, we're doing this for Costa. And I just think it brought this team just as close as humans can possibly be. You don't really have a choice. You can't just stop your life. Your life keeps moving. Senior defensive lineman Michael Bennett honored his late teammate, wearing Costa's number 53 for the remainder of the season, beginning with the Big Ten championship game. He had told me that he looked up to me, so that meant a lot to me because I just, I respected the crap out of the guy. I didn't want Costa to just be forgotten. So you're going to see his number the whole postseason. 
just had so many different emotions going. I was shaking and stuff and just ready to play. We gotta go. We gotta go and uh, we got a lot of confidence in the guy that's gonna be doing it. His name's Cardell Jones. He's been here for I think 120 years. Cardell Jones and I went to the same high school. That's Glenville High School in Cleveland, Ohio. We're from the same stuff. All you had to do was watch this guy play in high school to know he had the wherewithal to lead a team. I mean, he took his team to the state championship game uh, at, at Cleveland Glenville. Cardale Jones arrived on the Ohio State campus in January of 2012. Later that year, he became a household name, not for his throwing arm, but for a tweet. You know, he put that tweet out there. He probably thinks it's going to 100 of his friends. Next thing you know, like, uh-oh, uh, this is big, you know, and it was. He didn't grasp the enormity of what it meant to be a quarterback at The Ohio State University and all the responsibility that that entailed. He had one foot in, one foot out. Very immature, never took school serious here. And we had to come to Jesus meeting and it was very uncomfortable. Coach Meyer, you know, he got fed up with me. He called me in his office one day and he was just saying like, dude, what if you have to go in the game? These guys don't trust you. I'm just sitting here thinking like, dude, I'm a freshman. I'm going to register this year. Why does it matter? Because Cardell got into some like academic problems. So they said, well, your penalty is, we're going to take two of your game tickets. He goes, it ain't like I'm playing anyway. Couldn't miss any classes and couldn't miss any tutor sessions, any mandatory appointments, or we were taking them off scholarship. We took about three steps forward, one step back, and we just kept climbing the hill until we weren't taking any more steps back. I actually talked to him about, you know, leaving after the year was over because JT was having an unbelievable season. It was like, I need to go find my place. Cardell's a video game. When I knew that something was different is when I came home and he was not in there playing the game. I said, Cardell, where are you at? He said, I'm at the Woody watching film and throwing balls. I said, oh, okay. The stakes in Indianapolis were high. So were the challenges. A third-string quarterback making his first career start in the Big Ten championship game, focused on beating Wisconsin and earning the confidence of the selection committee. The conversation really never came up, can we win with this guy? It was always, we have to win with this guy. Coach Meyer told us all week we had to win big. A win or a close win wasn't going to get us in. The whole state of Ohio is counting on Cardale Jones. If you really study it, there's not one pass between the hashes. The whole game is going to be played out here because if we misfire out here, it goes out of bounds. Let's it go. He's got a receiver, Devin Smith. Oh, he made the catch. Everyone on the sideline was like, uh-oh, Diz, because that's what we call him, Cardizzle. There was just something that we, it was kind of a pick-me-up on the sidelines. What Coach Drain just was preaching to me all week is just that we got to keep Cordell comfortable. To the 50, Elliott, and he may be gone. 81 yards to the house. So that means you're going to have to play the best you've played your whole life. Going for it all. Oh, my goodness. Devin Smith again. Cordell Jones, baby. We got out there, and we were just playing unbelievable. They had the number one running back in the country, and he didn't get anywhere. Melvin Gordon running the right, and he gets drilled. Wow. The biggest growth that we had as a defense was when JT went down. And I think it was that true sense of feeling that, oh my goodness, they really need us. Football fumble, and Bosa takes it into the end zone for a touchdown. I was really thankful that night that I had a good game, because then I can show the jersey off. As Melvin Gordon had the ball knocked out of his hands by Michael Bennett. We trusted everybody, and it just, it was just a, a beating. It was bad. This is as thorough a dismantling of a quality, good football team as we've seen in college football this year. I was just blown away by the score. That was what I just couldn't get over, it was 59-0. I couldn't process that. 
the image that will stay with me is Urban Meyer wanting to congratulate Luke Fickle and Luke Fickle brushing him off. We got a shutout to finish here, coach. We got a shutout to finish. They never experienced winning. They never experienced celebrating. Never. They'd done everything else but win a championship. And you could see it was just unbridled joy and relief. I don't think there's any doubt we're one of the top four teams in America. After the game, I saw Urban Meyer and Shelly walking by me in the concourse. And then he said, do you think we're in? And I said to him, I, I just don't see how they could keep you out after 59 nothing." Their closing argument was probably the most impressive of anybody's beating Wisconsin the way they did. The 59-0 shellacking of Wisconsin earned Ohio State an invitation to the first ever college football playoff semifinals. Their opponent, number one seed, Alabama. Big bad Alabama running college football, running the SEC, the whole thing. The way that we practiced for that game was something I've never seen before. Ohio State entered the battle having lost its last 10 bowl games against SEC schools. When he wanted to take the Ohio State job, I said, well, how are you going to beat the SEC? I was like a little nag. I was like, you can't beat the SEC. Ohio State never beats the SEC. And he said, you can. For one game, you can. I said, well, here's your chance. You try to build up your opponent that they're bigger than life. And then as it gets closer to game time, you try to give them the perception versus reality speech. We did it in 06 when we played Ohio State. They were supposed to be right there with Alabama battling to win it all in the first place. It's just ridiculous the dips and the turns and the curves that a season can take. The first week of fall camp, I ended up breaking my wrist on the first day of full pads. It was a little bit devastating. Inside handoff and a loss on the play again. In his first two games, he has, I don't know, maybe 20 carries, 70 yards, you know, pedestrian type yards. When JT went down, and we put a little bit more on Zeke's shoulders. Ezekiel Elliott, he's still huffing. He's full speed, or he's getting water on the sideline. But I think it just took the guys around him getting better. The offensive line is the heartbeat of your team. The heartbeat just kept getting bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. You can't stop it. Emma Smith tweeted that there would be two great backs on the field that night, and uh, they both played for Alabama. And that kind of just was like a shot. The first long run by Ezekiel Elliott. He leaped over a guy. Down the right sideline goes Elliott. Gets to the 10. But I knew right then, we're good. After playing like the first quarter, I knew that we could play with those guys. This was who was going to be tougher, who would make the least mistakes. Bottles the snap. He's going to be taken down at the eight yard line. We dominated them the whole first half. Absolutely dominated them. They just capitalized on their opportunities better than we did. Wide open five into the end zone, touchdown. Plagued by two early turnovers and struggles in the red zone, Ohio State found themselves trailing 21 to six in the second quarter. I'm sure there was three-fourths of Buckeye Nation that, oh my goodness, here we go. No one was on the sideline like, oh my God, what's going on? We were just like, just keep playing, because we're beating the crap out of them. Just keep playing. Marshall has it at the 18 of Alabama, and that's where he is dropped. I remember converting on a lot of third and longs, standing in the pocket, you know, having delivered the ball down the field and tight windows. Jones takes off running, barrels his way to the 14 and gets the first down. I look at Coach Smith and say, we're calling this play, right? He's like, yeah, 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 we're calling it. Trailing 21-13, Ohio State drove deep into Alabama territory in the final minute of the first half. We had put it in when we played Michigan State. I get the ball and I'm running back there and I'm looking and I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna take off running. <laughs> I'm showing my parents, I was like, we have a play where I actually may get to throw the ball. And my mom's like, if it's not there, just please run, please run for me. Snap to Jones, hands at Marshall, and it's reverse. I'm thinking to myself, I'm throwing this bad boy no matter what. The ball is given to Spencer, who throws left corner of the end zone. Caught! That much of green space between Michael Thomas outside of his foot and, and out of bounds. Beautiful. I mean, the range of emotions you go through in a football game is crazy. 
I was really happy to see us being able to compete with them on the field because I was worried it could be a blowout. Jacob has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We were invited to Friday Night Lights Camp 2013 July. I gave him a football, we, he didn't throw very well, and so we had to get that right. We became very good friends right away. I just loved his human spirit. He was always around, so we, you know, the relationship kept building and building and building. Yeah, we got a long journey ahead, so you gotta be there with us on. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always wanted to play football and be a quarterback, and it kind of makes me sad because I, I can't play a sports like other people. Go box! Yeah. I felt like family because I was part of a team. Before the Alabama game, Jeff Fireman texted me and said, it has your tails, so I said, tails. Captain, what tails? The call is tails. So I called tails, and, you know, obviously Jacob was right. on toughness and fundamentals, and so do they. And so you have two sledgehammers going against each other. The Sugar Bowl heavyweight battle saw Ohio State carry its second quarter momentum into the second half. Down the right side, going Devin Smith, got it at the five and into the end zone, touchdown! Ohio State continued to go up. Uh, they kept taking it to a level that, frankly, Alabama wasn't willing to go to. Ohio State has yet to get a turnover in this game. It's about time. Steve, oh, they told him that week, like, you know, we have all these blitzers coming. Steve, you got to drop, and you're going to get the ball. Throws a field intercepted at the 40 by Ohio State, up the 30, and it's going to be an Ohio State touchdown by Steve Miller. When it comes true, it makes you look and feel like, oh, you know what, we're geniuses. Steve Miller's pick six allowed the Buckeyes to maintain the upper hand. The Scarlet and Gray clung to a seven-point lead with under four minutes remaining in the game. We call the play, and usually he'll like kind of glance out and then I'll motion in. He didn't do it. So I'm looking at him, looking at Cardell. I'm like, dude, I'm like, we need to motion me in. And then he snaps the ball. And I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to get in there in time. Hands it to Elliott who goes sweeping to the left side. I start to get closer to the linebacker, and I'm like, Zeke hasn't hit this hole yet. Like, I can get this guy pretty good. Loose to the 30, down the left side to the 50 goes Elliott. He's going to take it to the house. And I just hear this roar, and I turn around, and Zeke's gone. Buckeyes eight seconds away from a big invite. He throws the ball, and I'm like, I've seen this before. Where have I seen this situation before? Practice. We do this every Sunday. Guns it long down the right side, and that ball is going to be gone, and the Buckeyes get it. And the king of the SEC has fallen. The chase was officially complete. I know we had one more game, so I was very careful how I said that. But in my heart, you know, I, I, that was the one. By nature, you'd feel, think you could actually relax and, you know, really, truly celebrate this. And But the reality is, this means tomorrow morning we better get rolling because we got a bigger one now. Oregon won by 40. What was the 59 to 20? Oh. Oh, oh, I got to go. We got to go get ready for that one. The first ever national championship game of the playoff era featured number four Ohio State against number two Oregon. Semis is treated like the old bowl system where you go down early, you have bowl experiences. The championship game is treated like the game. My main message for him was to not feel the way I felt walking off the field with somebody else's color confetti falling all over. If you're going to be somebody, be the guy that feels good that day. So we in the locker room, and we're, yeah, man, it's just, it just don't feel like the championship game, you know? I feel like, like Alabama would have been like a championship game. All guys have been behind the dams each and every time so far. We get out there, and they, boom, right down the field score. All right, y'all, they came to play. Mariota, a lose one defender, throws and it is caught for an Oregon touchdown. All that was on in my mind was, man, I don't even want to know what they're saying about us on TV because you know that people are just like, oh, it's going to be 60 to zero. The first drive was 11 plays, and our whole philosophy was, hey, if they have to drive 10 to 12 plays and they score, we're okay. 
That's not what we believe they consistently will ever do on us. One guy was panicking, it was me. But I didn't see the, the bright-eyed look. Oregon owned the early stages of the game. And midway through the first quarter, Ohio State's sluggish offense faced third and long from inside its own 10-yard line. I definitely think they were nerves, as should be, playing in a national championship game. And I think we just needed one play. A lot of time Jones fires up the right side of the field and is caught by Corey Smith at the Ohio State 30. I was like, okay, these guys have confidence. And really, from that play on, the offense was unstoppable. We tried a new play. We didn't block the nose guard, and the tight end came from the wing and whammed the nose. And there was some apprehension about, well, this really worked because there was no video evidence. Hands it Elliott straight ahead, and he's found the hole to the 10 5. Touchdown, Ezekiel Elliott of Ohio State. Ohio State led by a touchdown early in the second quarter when a Cardale Jones fumble gave Oregon the ball near midfield. Some of those turnovers, our guys handled great. You know, they're not batting an eye, not worried, not ever pointing a finger, not ever blaming. True to their identity, Oregon has chewed a short field goal on fourth and goal from the three. When most people are not running the football. I said, if they run the ball, we're in trouble here. B-gap parts like the Red Sea. I'm like, oh, this is me. I got to stop them. Fighter still pushing forward. No signal no. yet. And he did not get into the end zone. And that was like changed the whole momentum of the game. Despite two first-half turnovers, the Scarlet and Gray build a 21-10 advantage at the break. Oregon had the Heisman Trophy winner. They didn't have what Ohio State had, which was the complete overall physical package to a win a national championship. The Buckeyes showed no mercy in the second half, scoring the game's final 21 points. Before my last touchdown, the whole stadium just screaming, Zeke, Zeke. Straight ahead goes Ezekiel Elliott. Touchdown. I mean, that's just something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. I'm just looking in the stands, just turning around, looking around, and I'm like, we really just did it. Ohio State national champions for the eighth time. It's a season that has just taken a lot of remarkable twists and turns. That promise he made me recruiting actually came true. He handed me the national championship trophy, and uh, I told him, Coach, I'm going to kiss it, and uh, that's exactly what I did. This team wasn't supposed to do this. We're officially brothers for the rest of our lives because we're champions. The most fun thing was when we got in the car, and Urban, he starts singing, Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead. And I mean, he was screaming it, and our whole car was singing, Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead. I see the statue of Woody Hayes when I walk by, that's home. And to bring that back to the state of Ohio and this great university, that's, it's hard to put into words. We're extremely grateful for who we play it with, and that's our brothers here, the 2014 team. I still get goosebumps thinking about it, man. As a senior captain, that's how you want to go out. It's really funny to call Ohio State an underdog story, but that's what it turned out to be. It was a lot of guys stepping up and saying, hey, you know, we're still here. We're still Ohio State. Name another team that ever won a championship with a third-string quarterback whose starting quarterback, a star, never plays it down. They have to deal with the death of a player. They have to deal with an early season loss and having to beat the odds just to get to the stage where they could win a championship. I don't know that any can top that one. This is the most selfless group of players and people that I've ever been around. I did a post-game interview, and I almost cried when I was thinking about just everything that we went through. No matter what happened, it's just like the, the tougher times got, the closer the team got to being family. I don't know if I'm ever going to play on another team that was like that. Seeing LeBron at our games gives us a little bit of juice. I'm like, it's LeBron's eyes. You see with the 23 jersey on, I'm like, okay, yeah, he got it. He's a Tigers Powell fan. He wants to be like me. That's okay. <laughs>